tell you, everybody, get you a white book. We're going to start with our song service, and we're going to start out with the song, Like a River Glorious, 516. 516 in our white book. Good to see all y'all out tonight. Good to see those online that are also joining us. And so it's, we are hot down here in Calvary, Georgia. Index, and the heat index is close to 110, I believe. And all that wet weather we had last week, it'd be nice to get a little shower right now. But um, <clears throat> we just saw Paul Work come in. He's a miracle walking around. And, uh, he's going to have two stints put in. He's walking around long. Betty's ready to just kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to stay in here with us. But uh, anyway, good to see him out rambling around. He's he is uh, almost a miracle walking around here. Our boy is a miracle. Had a heart attack this week and had two stents put in, and now he's a new man. And un unbelievable how our technology and things work these days with hospitals and doctors and the Lord, of course, in heaven. So let's uh, st stand and we'll sing 516, Like a River Glorious. <laughs> see some fruit from that as we planted seeds all week, Lord. We pray that that um, even young folks will come and know the Lord, Lord, because of our work. And we pray that you get all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And I have uh, the next song, 511. 511. The Son of Rock. 511. <clears throat> Thank mm -hmm.
Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Just came to get uh, my wife to look at somebody bump her head. Um, they, uh, they did that because my wife's a nurse, but I had to ask if it was an ER uh, kind of situation. My wife doesn't handle that very well. She's a nurse, bedside nurse. In our former church, we would have situations, when you don't remember, they, we had a wand and they were playing out on the parking lot, which was gravel with the asphalt and gravel. And this little boy fell on his knees and skinned him all up. And they came to get Carolyn because he had torn his trousers and he had bleed all over everywhere. everywhere. Anyway, she didn't handle stuff like that very well. So I went over there, they, they usually get me to go too. We rolled up his trousers leg and there was a big lump, big, big uh, bump on his knee, about that big. And uh, he's, he's crying and we're trying to find out what we need to do to help him. And I, I took a cotton swab or something. It was a stone that had gone through his knee, made an incision to slip out of the skin. And it was just under there, just like you slipped something. So we were able to push it out, and after that, the pain stopped, and we got him all taken care of. But just to tell you, my wife doesn't handle blood and guts too good. I hope this is just a bruise. Uh, okay, we'll be in uh, chapter 9 just for a moment tonight. We'll review what we talked about last week. But while you're turning there, I'm going to tell you a Paul joke. Uh, Rex was talking about uh, Paul's uh, uh, incident last week where he was taken to the ER uh, with a uh, paired heart condition. And, and ultimately got two uh, stents to go along with one he already had. But uh, it was a dark moment. Uh, he had been uh, exerting himself, overheated, and probably was about to have heat stroke anyway, but his heart uh, began to cause uh, blood flow problems, and so they had to put in stents. But uh, talking about Paul, I'll tell you a, Paul, a funny Paul story. I was out in my yard doing something a couple of days ago, Monday, I think. And I got a little shed I'm building. And my wife came out to the fig tree, which is visible where I'm working. And she started yelling at me uh, to get my attention. And I don't hear her very well anyway. And uh, so I go over to the fig tree and she said, Paul Posey called. That's my CPA in Tallahassee. He's, a, he's been a CPA for now probably 30 years. But I've known him, Paul, since he was a youngster. And he took over the office from somebody else and that used to be my CPA. Anyway, he said our taxes are ready to go. We got an extension and all that back in April. And uh, so then she just went right on and she said, Paul said he had a bird feeder. And he said he looked down there early in the morning, there was five squirrels stealing his bird seed. And so he just went and got his gun and came out and the squirrels all scattered and ran behind the tree, but he knew they'd come back out. And sure enough, I'm standing there amazed. Paul Posey did that? So he said that, she said the squirrel stuck his head out and he blasted him. And he went over and picked up the squirrel. I'm thinking, Paul Posey did that? And he said, uh, I don't want to clean the squirrel right now. I'm just going to take him, put him in a little bag and tie it up, put it in the refrigerator, and I'll clean him later and feed him to the cat. So he puts him in the refrigerator and he waits a while. This is Paul. And so, uh, Finally decides it's time to take care of the squirrel. He goes open the refrigerator and the squirrel's out of the bag. Now he's down on the lower shelf in a defensive position. So he closes the refrigerator. And I said, what do you do now? He said, well, he said he had one of those trash pickers up for a pitcher. So he then got that and opened up the refrigerator and grabbed the squirrel right quick and threw him in the yard. And the squirrel started scampering and the cat caught him and the squirrel didn't have a chance. I said, wow, I went on back to my work. And I was thinking about Paul Posey's in a, a shirt, white shirt and tie most of the time. He's in an office. He lives in Killarn, I think. Paul Posey shot us. Anyway, so we had noon lunch that day with our girls. So they all get there and we we're eating around the table. And my wife gets started to tell the story. She said, my brother Paul said this. She's got a brother named Paul that lives in Dublin, Georgia. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Who shot the squirrel? She said, my brother Paul. I said, she never switched gears. She just said, Paul, I thought it was CPA. So yesterday I went to pick up a text and I told him the squirrel story. Okay, chapter 9, and we, when we studied uh, last week, we talked about the Euphrates River and the four uh, demon-like uh, uh, 
beings that came out of the uh, river. We talked about maybe they might be invisible to the eye. I don't know, it's not clear. You can certainly see the damage they're doing, but I immediately thought when I left here, uh, before I even got in the car, there, there's, there's precedent for that. Um, in the book of uh, Second Kings, you may well recall when we were there, in the days of Elisha, he had, uh, he had learned that the Syrian king was coming against Israel, and he gave him the wrong directions and had him come to where he was, and uh, ac actually the Lord was revealing to Elisha what the king of Syria Benadad was doing. In fact, his servant said he was repeating what he said in his bedchamber, even in secret. But uh, this, the servant of Elisha said, oh my, he said, go and, and, and look at the, all these uh, soldiers surround the city. He said, behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore said him then horses and chariots, and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about all around. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, and behold, and a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and the servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots and fire round about Elisha. Those were invisible until his eyes were open. It could be that during this time that a uh, similar situation. Now uh, you have to have an eye to see spiritual things many times. But in the case of of uh, this infernal cavalry coming out of this uh, Euphrates River, they begin to spread death and destruction, even to the extent of killing one third of all the men. And you remember they had fire and brimstone out of their nostrils. They had smoke and fire out of their they had tails, stingers in their tail, and it appears from verse 20 and 21, look at that, the last part of the chapter, it says, and the rest of them which were not killed, they killed a third of them. You can just imagine the, the burning, the brimstone, uh, the scorching of the land, and the smoke, if you have any kind of allergies, and all that stuff was going on, but there were many not killed. Verse 20, the rest of them which were not killed by the plagues yet re repented not of their works. It did not cause the wicked and, and, uh, and unrighteous to, to repent and say, oh God, be merciful. They did not repent, not of the works of their hands, and they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders or their sorceries or of their fornication or their thefts. So, when tragedy, when hardship, when punitive things happen to people, it doesn't necessarily make them turn to God. There's a verse in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 that says it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. I'm just talking to Paul about that, and he said God reminded him of many things he had done for him, the goodness he had shown to him. It makes us want to obey makes us want to serve the Lord when we realize how good he is. I have, in, 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 uh, in contrast to that, because of my former life and my occupation, I saw lots of jailhouse repentance. People get in trouble. We used to have a judge named John Rudd, and folks would come before him weeping and pleading for mercy. He said, oh, you've got jailhouse religion. A week from now, be right back to where, and they would. They get somebody get sick, go to the hospital. I've been to many, many bedsides where people, oh, I'm gonna serve the Lord when I get it. The Lord will just let me do the Lord. I made a promise. I made a bargain with God. If He gets me out of here, I'm gonna serve Him. And a week or two, you couldn't find Him. So the, the goodness of God leads and repentance. The Bible said. So just for a moment, let's think about a little bit later time because here we can talk about a 200 million size army, which is you know never happened. Four. And uh, we'll see it again. I just want to mention this and also suggest now that you read the next three or four chapters, maybe prior to next week, it'll help you understand. Because we're going to be introduced to seven uh, major characters that will be uh, at the forefront during this interim between the sixth trumpet. Now we're still talking about the sixth trumpet. 
And that's the end of the first three and a half years of tribulation. The sixth trumpet, that angel, and these, the, the 200,000, those beasts out of the bottomless pit, and these out of the Euphrates River, wind up the first three and a half years of tribulation, 1260 days. The last half of the tribulation will all be covered in the seventh trumpet. We'll see that after these chapters. But in the meantime, there's an interval. There's kind of a, a, a slow, slow down of the action. And, and God sets a parenthesis and tells us about what the activities will be going on during the great trib and, the, and, the, and what Satan is doing and, and something about a woman and a man child and a dragon. And so we'll get into that in, in the next chapter or so. But just for a moment, let's think about what's going on here with these and think about that in chapter 12, it said there's war in heaven. And so we think about when the Lord comes back, and we know that he's already been said to be riding white horses in chapter 19. Uh, between, there'll be war in chapter 12 between Michael the angel and his angels and Satan is his angels. That's in chapter 12. We'll be there in a little while. We know that Satan has his armies and no doubt these 200 million horsemen mentioned here are part of that. Uh, we know that no such army like that has ever existed. It's not, or, not, they're not ordinary horsemen either, uh, or ever could be. They were, they're demon-like creatures that we've never seen before. And so just before the seventh trumpet sounds, to begin the last three and a half years, we see the devil raising his armies, beginning conflict, uh, it starts to get uh, more and more intense, more and more great tribulation. And that's what the last three and a half years is called, great tribulation. You remember that the, uh, the, the book of Revelation gives us a chronological order of all time, from the very uh, start of the world, in particular from the birth of Christ until the, the kingdom age. Uh, and, and we had the first three chapters that talked about the professing realm of, of Christianity up to the rapture in chapter 6 to chapter 19 is a description in detail of this tribulation period we're talking about between the rapture and the second coming of uh, the Lord to set up the uh, glorious kingdom. I want to take a moment here and talk about something I learned years ago that will help us in perspective. If you have your Bible and took to, turn to Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 2 and 3, uh, we tend to think that, that America and, and the local church, we tend to think that Christians today are the primary object of God's love and blessing and concern. And the truth is, it's not, it's not true. The church age is a parenthesis in time. It's not that long consider, if you consider all of time. But the church age begins with the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2 and it goes to the rapture but that's a parenthesis of time it's a dispensation where God stops his clock and speaking of that probably next week will be the appropriate time for us to look at Daniel's 70 week prophecy Daniel's 70 week prophecy is in chapter 9 through 12 of Daniel and it actually gives you the number of days right down to when, when the, uh, the clock starts and uh, and when the clock stops at the end of time, except that it sets up a parenthesis time that we don't know how long. We don't know how long God will have this age we call grace. And that's, you know, we had an age of law. That was during Israel's, even in the birth of Christ, it was called the age of law. The Bible said that the law came by Moses, but grace came by the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we get to Ephesians, the Apostle Paul kind of explains that. And I think it's, Part of chapter 2, um, he says in uh, verse 11, let's just move quickly through here. He said, Wherefore remember, and he's talking to us, to Gentile, that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh are called uncircumcised by that which is called the circumcision. Now the circumcision of the Jews, and we're, we're not, we're the Gentiles. He said that in that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant. We didn't have the prophets. We didn't have the Ten Commandments as Gentiles and heathen nations. We didn't have the promises of God and had no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you sometimes were far off are now made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now look down to verse 19. Now therefore, we are no more strangers, 
Some things changed when Christ came. We're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly together groweth into a holy temple of the Lord. He's talking about the church. We, we're, we're part of God's plan now. In whom you also build it together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. God came and lives and dwells in us, but our bodies are a temple. Now here's what you want to see. This parentheses of time, the age of grace, was a mystery. There are many mysteries mentioned in Scripture. There's a mystery of, of, uh, of sin. There's a mystery of un ungodliness. This is a mystery of the church. Now notice this. We won't read it all, but let's put in it uh, verse uh, 9. Uh, he said, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Paul said, I have now been given understanding, and I'm going to share it with you. I, I saw, he says that back up in verse 3, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. Paul said, he probably did that when he was caught up in the third heaven. Remember that? He said he heard and saw things he couldn't repeat after he was saved and called the minister. Paul said, I was given the revelation to know the mystery, whereby when you read you may understand the knowledge that I have of the mystery of Christ. So in verse 9 he said, I want to make all men see what the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God. It wasn't revealed to the prophet. They had no clue. When the prophet Ezekiel, when the prophet Isaiah got their revelations and visions about the end time, it was always about Israel. It was always about this time of tribulation we've been talking about. Nothing about the church. God kept that as a secret, but he revealed it to Paul, and now we know that the church was a uh, was by God's plan from the beginning. It was just a secret. It was a mystery. But when the church left in chapter 4 of Revelation, raptured out, now we're back to a primary relationship between God and Israel. And it's not good. It is really, uh, it is the wrath of God coming on his chosen people. And, uh, and we'll see more about that later. But he said, to the intent that now the principalities and powers and heavenly flavors might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. And so in chapter 3 of Ephesians, you find out that the church beforehand was not known by the early prophets and even the apostles. It was a mystery. And we have now, since the church is gone, that we have a, the target, the focus is on Israel and not the church. And we're, we're, not, we're no longer here. So uh, just wanted to make sure you understood that because a lot of people misunderstand they they try to appropriate things in Israel to the church, and the church of Israel confuse all that. Now, after this interval between the sixth trumpet and the seventh, we have a, another book uh, that is that is uh, talked about. It's called a little book. Look at chapter ten of uh, Revelation. You remember the book that we saw in chapter five was was a seal book. It was a book that had all these seven. Uh, seals, and it was in the hand of the Lord, and and uh, one by one they're opened up. But in chapter 10, he said, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud and a rainbow. Now, who's that, who's that going to be? Who's, who had the rainbow that John saw back in first? This is no doubt the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's called the angel of the Lord and the messenger of the Lord many times in the Old Testament. But he said, this is a mighty angel. He came down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was it was the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and he had in his hand a little book. I notice he calls it a little book. Open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth. That's a picture of somebody that's won a victory. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roared. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their, uttered their voices, I was, I was about to write, this is John said, I heard a voice from heaven say to me, seal up those things which uh, the seven thunders uttered and write them not. It's not time yet to reveal that. Don't write that. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lift up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven 
and the earth and the things that they're in and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be no time be timed no longer but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophet we'll leave all three in there a moment we got a little book now uh, that it's not really clear what this book is except there's some clues some think it's the same book that the Lord had in chapter 5 and, and gave start breaking these seals to release all these plagues and, and, uh, and, and, and the wrath of God on the earth it seems like God's distinguishing this book though from that book it could be the same book but that book was a book of uh, that reveal the punishment and the wrath of God on the earth. And it was the, it was what was required to redeem the earth. Remember we talked about the title deed, like they used to do in the Old Testament. They had to, to redeem a person, a, a wife, or redeem a piece of property, or whatever. They had to find a kinsman redeemer. Well, that book was the title deed. That sounds like it would have been a pretty big book full of all those seals and the, and the description of the earth and all that. This says it's a little book. And when you read about what it has, it sounds like another book that we read about in the book of Daniel. If you have your Bible, turn there for a moment. This is probably the same book. Daniel chapter 12. And by the way, there's no way to understand the book of Daniel except through the book of Revelation because he got the same visions and revelation that we see there. In chapter 12, we won't read it all, um, but let's turn over to uh, verse 4 of chapter 12. But thou, o Daniel, he's already revealed all these things to Daniel, some of the same things we've just been talking about that we'd be having to, to Daniel's people. He said, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. So it's been closed all this time. This is what God kept... Uh, away from the prophets and, and the apostles. This is something that, that is, was for a special time to an end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. And so Daniel was told to shut up this little book, this, whatever this book was. It sounds like it might be the same book now that's open. And notice what it does. It's some, John is asked to do something very strange. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and the, and, the, and the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things of their end, so on. He said, uh, in verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spake of me, said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the book, little book. And he said to me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. What is all that about? John is asked to eat this little book. Now that doesn't sound like it's the title of Eve of the earth to me. And uh, it sounds more like this book contains something good, and something bad. He said it's going to be like honey in your mouth, but it'll be bitter. It'll be like gall to your stomach. Years ago, we had many, many revival meetings in our formal church, a lot of missionaries, and very frequently we had witnessing classes. Uh, we've been to every kind of tactic and strategy you can think of to witness using gospel tracts, uh, using all kinds of strategies. But one of them was, in fact, I think they created a tract that said this, the good news and the bad news, or the bad news and the good news. And what you would do is you would tell somebody the bad news first. The bad news are you're, you're a sinner. The way you sin is death. That's the bad news from Romans chapter 6. But the good news says, but the gift of God is eternal life. So you go through a series of scriptures that said, the bad news is you don't have, you're going to be turned into hell according to Psalm chapter 9 with all the other unrighteous. But the good news is, the gift of God is eternal life. 
But here it sounds like this book is the good news that Israel is going to be redeemed. God in the fight said this Sunday morning, is, is, uh, as wrathful as God is, he's still a God of grace. And he is going to, he's already marked 144,000, remember that? He's already marked and sealed them from the devil and his, and his, uh, his armies. God's going to have a remnant of Israel. That's the good news. There's going to be a time when they're going to be restored. They're going to be back in the land. They're going to be back in the temple. We're going to see that latter part. The bitter part of that is what's come before them. The judgment and the wrath they're about to suffer to get there. When John ate the book, he tasted that good redemptive plan. This is wonderful. God's going to redeem our people. But then when he read about the tribulation period, that's the bitter part. The same thing can be seen in the book of Ezekiel. You have your book there, if you have your Bible there, turn to Ezekiel, uh, I think it's chapter 3. He said, moreover, this is God talking to, his, to, to Ezekiel, same kind of thing. He said to me, son of man, now here's why he's saying this to Ezekiel. Just like we've studied in Jeremiah, Sunday school presently, Israel was on a roller coaster all through the Old Testament. They would serve God for a little while, and then they'd go really off into sin. And this is one of those times he sent Ezekiel to tell them what was the consequences of their sin. And Ezekiel was timid, and, and he feared them. And he said, you, you be like a, you be like an anvil. You be like an ad. You be hard. You put your head, your head be harder there. If you bump heads with your head, it's going to be hard. I want you to be tough. He said, More, he said to me, Son of man, eat that which thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak to the house of Israel. He'd already given him all the detail. He's called it a roll. I want you to eat it. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. Isn't that strange? And he said to me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Oh, it was good, that road. But then when you turn over to verse 14, he said, I went in bitterness when he saw the other part in the heat of the Spirit. The hand of the Lord was strong upon me. God began to re reveal to Ezekiel there's much more to come. It was sweet to start with, but oh, how bitter when you realize what he was going to do to his people. So this little book uh, was uh, taken by John, and uh, the Lord said to eat the little book, uh, and we're going to see that this this is really the parenthetical time that the three and a half years of the tribulation period comes to a close, and when the seventh trumpet is blown, we'll have the beginning of the great tribulation, the three and a half years, the 1260 days. But in this interim, that's the reason I suggest you read the next three or four chapters. The, this section uh, covers several events that we want, we want to look at before we get to the to the third woe. It's it's a we, we've already seen the great army. We saw the great uh, the uh, the little book, and now we're going to see that men didn't repent. They're left over to suffer the consequences of that later on. And uh, when, he, when he set his foot on the land and sea, that's a picture of the Lord when he comes back to the earth in his glory. In the old times, you've seen this probably in uh, movies like uh, Ben-Hur or whatever. In the old times, when a victor, when a Roman soldier was victorious over his enemy, he put his foot on his neck. That was symbolic. And everything that that, that soldier had was spoiled and that Victor could bring it back and he'd come back in glory and they'd have a big celebration. That's the picture here of the Lord. And he's standing on the sea and the earth and he's, he's, he's uh, saying uh, that he swear by him that liveth forever and ever. That's, that's the Father. Uh, that time should be no longer. Now, in verse 6 it says, time no longer. That's not a literal translation. It sounds like everything will stop right here, but we still got three and a half years to go. What he's saying is there'll be no more delay. Once this sixth angel and these, uh, this parenthesis we talked about is over, it'll move swiftly. 
it'll be no more delay. And he said there, uh, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that's when everything, will, when that seventh angel blows his trumpet, there will be other, uh, other uh, waves of God's judgment on the earth to the point that chapter 7, it says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. Uh, that mystery of God there is not the mystery of the church. Oh, we just talked about the vision. The mystery of the church has already, already been revealed. We've called out and, and been raptured to the Lord. We haven't met him in the air. We're in heaven with him. The mystery here is something entirely different. Have you ever wondered, most everybody wondered why you're here, where'd you come from, where, you know, we know who mom and dad is and all that, but just wonder how you as an individual got here. It was the grace of God. But do you ever wonder about why God let things happen like they happened? Why did he let Satan uh, lead Adam and Eve into sin and wreck the world? Why would God let them do that? That's a mystery. And there's a lot of other mysteries, but if you've ever thought deeply about what we know as a Christian, why did God, he could have just spoke and he could have destroyed Satan back in the garden. He could have stopped it right there. Why did he allow this, the sin of Satan to be transferred to Adam and Eve and then every generation after that and all the thorns and thistles and all the suffering and all the storms and all the tears. Why did he allow that to happen? He says, when this is over, that mystery will be finished. We'll understand. I had a thought. This is not the Bible. This is off the record. I had a thought. Maybe there have been other worlds. God may have other worlds. I don't know if he's got anybody out on the, in, this, in the solar system now. But maybe there have been other worlds. And maybe, maybe he decided to do it different this time. Maybe he's got other worlds. Well, maybe he wanted to prove something. Maybe he wanted to prove that God would serve him in spite of the devil's power and how influential and, and uh, how, how strong the devil is. Maybe he wanted to prove that people would willingly come to him and, and love him. I don't know. But there's mysteries. And, he, and, and John says here, when this is over, the mysteries of God will be finished. And he hath declared to his servants, the prophets, we'll understand. We sing that song. We'll understand it better by and by. So maybe that's what it's about. I don't know. But anyway, we know that the last three and a half years is, is really is what's called the Great Tribulation. And when that's over, then the Lord will come back with all of his saints. And that will be a glorious time when he sets up the, the kingdom. Uh, verse 7 kind of explains that, you know, this is not that there won't be any more time. It simply means there won't be any more delay. And he said, uh, verse 8, And the voice said, which I heard from heaven, spake me, take the little book and eat it. And so John did eat it. And you, you find the record. Uh, he said, Paul, he said, John, you've got a lot more to learn. He said, I took the little book out. The angel of heaven ate it. It was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And as soon as I'd eaten it, it was bitter. And he said to me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So there's a lot more yet to follow. Now, when we get to chapter 11, we'll talk about the, the, the two witnesses. Here we're going to be introduced to. In these three chapters, we're going to see the two witnesses that come and preach on the streets of Israel. They're going to be killed. The Satan's going to rise up again. We'll see that in detail. There are God's two witnesses. A lot of speculation of who they might be. Nobody knows for sure. But it sounds like it might be Moses, it might be Elijah. Uh, you know, Elijah never died. He went to heaven in a, in a fiery chariot. Some folks thought it might even be Enoch. He didn't die. Maybe it is. But those two witnesses that God says are his, his witnesses. And by the way, there's another clue that, that, that the uh, angel of the Lord holding the little book is the Lord because they, he said, they're my witnesses. He said, in verse 3, he said, I will give power to my witnesses, my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. They're going to be evangelists, and they're going to be preaching on the street. And by the way, that is the only preaching from the time of the rapture of the church until the end 
The church is gone. The spirit of God's gone. That's why everything corrupts so fast. It just the, the, there won't be a a there won't be salt of the earth. There won't be anything to keep it from spoiling. It's going to get. That's the reason it says here they didn't repent of their sins and their works. They don't want to know God. Probably by this time today we hear a lot about banning bad books. I can almost guarantee you in that period the Bible will be banned. They'll probably burn Bibles, burn churches. They don't want any any remembrance of God in that period of time. They're ungodly. They get worse and worse. And so when these two witnesses come, they're going to hate them and despise them, especially the devil, and they're going to slay them. But then we're going to meet uh, two more people. We're going to meet a, a woman that's clothed in the sun, and she's got a child. And you can figure out who that is uh, if you like. But there's seven of the characters. They also have the, the, the uh, witnesses of the devil, the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth. And uh, so we have uh, a lot of things coming about in these two chapters that we kind of see that sets up uh, the end, sets up the battle of Armageddon, sets up uh, the Lord coming back on his horse. And, uh, and what, what I want you to see is it's always been a, a uh, situation where God said, if you'll serve me, if you'll keep my law, they always told him, if you keep my law, if you'll obey me, you'll be blessed. All through Deuteronomy you see that. In John's gospel, uh, John writes, we read John 3.16 all the time, for God so loved the world. But in 3.17 the Bible says, for God sent not his son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through it might be saved. There's always been that if. There's been, God said to some, if you don't, notice what verse 18 said, he that believeth on him is, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. People who have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ are under condemnation because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten of God. So it's, that's the good and bad news. The belief and the trust and the faith in Christ is what makes the difference. Jesus said if they are already under condemnation if they haven't believed. Jesus came not to condemn, but it's, it's like God said, uh, this is the goodness of God, but if you don't accept it, then you get the wrath of God. So we're going to see that in chapter 11 to a great extent. It's time. I was afraid of that. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about the witness and some of these characters the following week. Uh, but read, if you will, 11, 12, and 13. And 13, we're introduced to the Antichrist, and that's, a, that's the devil uh, incarnate. He enters the Antichrist just like God entered his son Jesus. Uh, came on incarnate. You see that in chapter 13. But if you read these three chapters, it'll help us when we look at it next week. Father, thank you for the time we've had together. We thank you, Lord, for the for the revelation that we're not in darkness and we're not in ignorance, even though we'll be spectators and uh, we'll be out of the picture during some of these times. We thank you that we have the revelation tonight and that it should inspire us and, and uh, Lord, uh, it ought to give us the unction to go out and make sure our loved ones and our neighbors and our friends get in the fold before it's too late. We thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you got 508 in the white book. 508, have faith in God. We'll sing our first and last stanza, and then we'll have our prayer time. Let's we'll stand as we sing 508.
Right. Yeah, that's a good song at the end of it. Mm-hmm. If you don't have faith in God, then you're on the wrong side of it. That's one of Mama's favorites. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's your favorite? One of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How is the little girl doing that day? Did you hit her in? Oh, yes. She, uh, somebody was in.